are you doing, Rebecca? I'm well, how are you? Better than I deserve, I guess. And <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the delay, you know, things are a bit, uh, you know, uh, or everybody's passionate about the topic. So uh, very, very quick introduction. Rebecca works for Rubrik, Director of the Developer Relations, and she's going to be talking about how to deliver an exceptional infrastructure as a code using REST and GraphQL API. So I'm going to get out of the stage, and uh, it's all yours. Sure. Let me share my screen. Perfect. Well, welcome to my co-presenter. <laughs> we'll make yeah. it uh, as, as kind of quick as we can um, and get through the topic at hand. But uh, thank you very much for having me. We can go ahead and hit next. Um, so my name is Rebecca, and as I mentioned before, I do lead our developer relations team at Rubrik, which includes not only our dev advocates, but also a lot of our API uh, ecosystem integrations, such as our SDKs, tooling uh, integrations, and so on. And so I realize that you know we're not necessarily a name brand company like a like a Netflix of the world. So I do quickly want to go over what makes um, our problem a little bit unique, uh, and then I want to talk really about the user experience. And then the last piece is kind of how we engineered our way through this next. So Rubrik sits in um, a space called cloud data management next. And so what cloud data management does is it's, it does several different things. Um, so the first thing we did when we began is we began with data center protection. So how can we ingest, index, manage, archive, replicate, and so on, all of your data on premises? And that included being able to archive data out the cloud, which quickly began um, getting lots of questions from our customers of, well, how do we now protect our data in that same declarative manner in the cloud? Um, and then beyond that, we began, um, because we were an immutable file system, began being able to manage things like uh, resiliency against ransomware because of our immutability and so on. Um, because we are holding your data all across your on-premises and cloud, right? That's where we're able to provide deeper metadata insights into things like encryption and governance and so on, okay? So don't wanna focus on rubric too much, just kinda wanna mention that briefly. So next. Because what's interesting is when we were really creating this company five, six years ago, when we looked at our kind of incumbents that we were looking to displace, we noticed that APIs were not really a part of any platform at all. And so when we kind of did the pen to paper, our pen to napkin drawing of what do we want cloud data management to be redefined as, one of the big pillars for us was always being API driven. Next. And so, like I mentioned, this was in stark contrast to our market incumbents who didn't have a public API at all, or that API was licensed, it was a shim layer, it was a bolt-on, and the existence of APIs in our space primarily came through acquisitions rather than it being a strategic part of the platform, right? And so that's where we wanted to be very, very different next. And so when we think about our customers, and the only reason I even mention this is that many of our end users had little to no API experience. And so we come out with this new platform and here we are, you know, flying all around the world, touting our APIs as a big selling point of our product. And to be perfectly honest, no one cared. Um, next slide. And so we, because we initially were selling to our IT ops folks, we really didn't care very much about having an API. Their preference back in 2014, 2015 was, your product should just have 6 million different widgets and then 5 million more plugins or snap-ins that do the rest. But in reality, that's really just because they weren't comfortable interacting with an API. And so a, not, a lot of our initial feedback was really just go build us a PowerShell module or a Python SDK or a plugin for some monitoring tool and stop talking about your APIs. Next slide. And so for us, you know, that wasn't really, uh, you know, an option. We didn't want to just stop talking about our APIs because they're such a big part of our platform. Uh, next slide. Um, actually, it skipped a slide there. Sorry, I don't know if it, there we go. Um, and so we, when we um, were talking to our customers initially and they're saying, go build us integrations, go build us these things, we don't care about APIs. We decided we were going to do both. Okay, so this is where we really initially focused our efforts. So we realized very early on that we we're going to have to make our API onboarding as simple as possible. And for somebody who was, generally speaking, 
not a developer, somebody who was far more focused on managing and maintaining infrastructure. And so secondly, that meant that when it came to our API, it had to be fully featured. Every single thing that they did in the UI had to be accessible via the API. And our resources that we are creating had to be extremely user friendly. Again, not just have resources, have documentation, but have resources and documentation and code samples that can be understood by both developers that were integrating with our platform and our end users that were maybe a backup administrator, right? So being able to really speak to both audiences. And then lastly, we did have a dedicated team of folks who do provide those built-in integrations. Next slide. So as our platform capabilities matured out of the data center, and we really started building out a robust cloud platform, so did our API consumers. So we went from having, you know, not just IT ops folks and enterprise architects asking about our APIs, but if you hit next, there will, we also began having a number of developers and DevOps folks that were using our platform. Go ahead and hit next. One more time. What's up? Okay, am, am I good with the slides? Yeah, yeah, it's just a little bit slow, I think, for some of the animations. I don't think it's you at all. Um, and so as we start looking at more of the DevOps personas, they really wanted to begin using infrastructure as code principles. And our product squarely fits within infrastructure, right? So we've seen a major uptick in our platform's adoption, specifically by folks like service providers who use our APIs to then extend those services further. Next slide. So when we think about how users do use our API first platform, kind of again, thinking of the space that we're in selling primarily to IT ops folks. So when we think about things like service providers, they're looking to integrate data management into their own sort of custom service portals. So they don't ever wanna to have to leave their ticketing systems to do things like assigning SLAs, performing data restores, or even monitoring some sort of data governance report. And they regularly are building custom dashboards. Uh, the next thing is our customers with really large data centers, right? They want to simplify deployments via configuration management, right? They want to be able to build out that data management policy layer via something like Ansible or Terraform. And then the middle use case is monitoring and logging. And that is by far something that virtually every single customer wants. And this includes integrating with off the shelf software, as well as custom in-house built systems. And then, of course, as we've seen that uptick of cloud adoption and uh, adoption of our cloud native services, we see customers more and more wanting to assign data management policies and provision those resources through CI pipelines. So what's been really fun is if we went five years ago, we had pretty much just backup administrators either not using our APIs or only interacting via scripting languages like PowerShell or into now where we're having these very sophisticated enterprise companies that are using CI CD pipelines to roll out our data management policies as a service. Next slide. So as our users got more savvy, we really had to get more savvy as well. Um, so we went from having, you know, again, very little API usage. Really, we were our biggest consumer for a long time of our APIs um, because of our UI. And we went from having very little API usage to having millions of requests in a day to 100 million to billions, <coughs> excuse me. And so we very quickly realized that our focus on user education at the beginning was paying off, which is great. <coughs> excuse me, trying, uh, trying not to cough and instead I'm getting choked up. And so um, by us investing in our community and investing in our customers and providing them an abundance of free education, we were able to really just multiply the usage of our API exponentially. But because we are so focused on user education, to be honest, we really kind of lost focus a little bit on our API hygiene. Next. So that kind of slide that you saw just a second ago was a dashboard that's really kind of showing something that we built custom to start getting more uh, visibility into exactly what APIs are being used, what methods, what endpoints, uh, understanding response times of performance to allow us to be a lot more proactive. Um, but ultimately we had accrued some technical debt that we had to pay down. Next slide. So 
like I mentioned, our API has always been available for our customers, but for a while we were really kind of the only one using it. And we started with REST at the very beginning because that's what was available in 2015, 2016. And it was really the most kind of common API in the data center at that point. And GraphQL was still closed source at Facebook and very, very new at that point. So we adopted later GraphQL for our SaaS platform. Um, it was very much uh, easier to iterate and develop against. We uh, it reduced the amount of requests that were needed and often into a single query and, you know, strongly typed model for the win. Next slide. But, you know, we went from this transitional period of having very little users on our API to having billions and billions of requests in a day. So initially we ran into quite a few roadblocks, even internal um, when it came to engineering. So initially we didn't have an engineering team focused on APIs. Instead, each individual engineering team in the back end was responsible for their own surface areas endpoints. And um, if, if you know how this goes, when everybody's responsible for something, then no one's really responsible. So very quickly, you know, we, we realized our versioning was messed up or we just didn't even have proper versioning. Um, breaking changes became normalized and the standards for you know, models, parameters, enums just didn't exist. So basically we created a little bit of a mess and didn't really think customers were gonna adopt it, got huge customer adoption. So this created friction. Um, so the first thing we had to do is really standardize the way that we are doing business across all of our different engineering teams. Next slide, which is interesting um, to try and standardize that because what the next slide will show um, whenever it pops up in my view um, is that we have a huge surface area, right? Because we manage data, we're managing data from all sorts of sources. This could be um, Oracle databases, SQL databases. This could be non-relational databases. Um, these are file servers and NAS um, systems all over your data center. These are hypervisors and these are cloud native, right, as well. So your different cloud native applications, um, your buckets in the cloud, um, your compute instances and so on, right? So a huge ecosystem and we're trying to standardize all of our APIs across all of this, right? So very, very challenging. Next slide. So as we continue to grow in employee and uh, consumer count, it became more and more important for us to have a very resilient infrastructure in place to support our REST APIs, right? That's what we started with originally. And we were doing that in the most scalable and maintainable way. So we've moved away from having, um, you know, everybody individually responsible to having one engineering team 100% responsible for the design, the review, and effect effectively the publication of our APIs. And the first thing that they did was set and establish a clear set of design goals that everyone has to follow for REST. And so the goal of these design specifications really established a set of practices that we committed to following in our implementation of our REST API. And this really aims to address our needs to address performance and functionality requests that we're often dealing with and doing this in a very scalable and maintainable fashion. But more importantly, by having a very standardized API, this allows us to very quickly ramp up our new engineers, but more importantly, ramp up our customers. Because again, our customers aren't necessarily developers. Next slide. So given kind of our current bank of data sources and you know, REST APIs and their functionality, um, things like the URL structure became very, very difficult for us to standardize. So to be honest, we find a lot of exceptions to the rules that we have in place, but the rules still exist. Um, so generally speaking, we try to use like the major surface area integration for the root. And then things for like singular versus plural. Um, for list resources, we always use singular form. So for example, it would be Git, data center to get a list of all of the data center resources, right? Not just get data centers. Um, and then Boolean, right? Boolean field naming conventions. So, you know, everything should kind of start with a has or is or should to make it clear that's a Boolean field. So for example, it would be has root access or should do something. Next slide. So once we established the standardization, then the next thing we had to do was communicate these standards to our customer. And so again, this was happening very much in parallel to the customer education that I was describing at the very beginning. So we went through and we described how we introduced a version into the path. Uh, we established specific version control processes and models. Uh, we use internal and make that public to our users, but that's really to develop new endpoints. 
Uh, and then of course we use a proper version like B1, B2 to publish our stable endpoints. And again, all of this became documented and communicated to the customer. Next slide. Now, as we started feeling a little bit more confident and comfortable with, with REST and our you know, engineering of our API, then we introduced GraphQL. We introduced our SaaS platform. Um, so kind of GraphQL came and you can hit next a couple of times. I think there's a few animations. And you know, the joke on the slide is, you know, kind of a new challenger appears here. And so you know, I mentioned that originally our platform was built in 2015. So at that time, GraphQL was not open sourced yet. So we began looking at GraphQL in 2017, and we eventually adopted it for our SaaS platform that we launched the following year. And this provided us dramatic speed improvements for the GUI specifically. Um, so when we were stress testing load times, um, REST was nearly uh, double that of GraphQL. And then as more and more objects were added to our back end, because again, we have a huge ecosystem, REST continued to fall behind. Um, and so, you know, the, the ability to kind of simply query all objects provided a lot more flexibility with return values. And so because we experienced such improved performance and such ease of use with GraphQL, we've since then added it to our on-prem product. Next slide. So again, a slide that kind of outlines our design goals specific to our platform use cases, but you know, kind of serves to show you how we're thinking about designing GraphQL. So each schema entry should be designed to include business logic use cases and not just data. So for example, it's common for um, clients to want to access only like events from the last mm, five days, right? So this current approach really requires that clients are able to calculate the current time and then add in the X period of time and then convert that to the format that the API accepts. So instead of doing that, we can then provide something like an events from time period in hours argument that will automatically complete those steps on the server and provide the needed results. Again, once, once again, simplifying that uh, usability for our, our end, uh, customers. And then whenever we want to do things like limit a number of possible values returned by a field, an enum should be used instead of a string. And again, this not only allows our clients to know exactly what to expect, but also allows us to communicate changes to those possible values. Next slide. So I know I went pretty quickly um, through this, trying to kind of catch up on time. So I'm going to start kind of wrapping it up. Um, so I wish I could spend a little bit more time on it, but I want to be conscious of, you know, the fellow speakers that are coming after me. So some of the challenges that we've experienced, you know, one of the things that we wanted to be very conscious of because of the, the depth and breadth of our ecosystem is not to publish our schema all in one go, but instead we're rolling it out surface area by surface area. And we're still defining and separating those business logic errors versus server side errors uh, in the schema itself. And then the other big challenge for us is really the same one that we started with. A huge portion of our customer base is in IT ops. And now we've educated them on REST. They become REST power users, but they're brand new to GraphQL. So the big challenge for us this year and next year is really replicating that same user education success that we had with REST with GraphQL. Next slide. So some of our key takeaways, next slide. First one comes to SDK and tooling development. So a big key to our API success was really the accessibility of SDKs and other tooling. And when it came to SDK development, we really let our customers drive that roadmap as to what languages and tools and even function prioritization within that. And then from there, we spent a lot of time educating our users as to how they can contribute back. And so we've seen a huge uptick and now we have a lot of customers really driving the growth of those different integrations. Next slide. And then lastly, if we could do it all over again, um, you know, um, I would say that we would uh, really, you know, make documentation a priority at the beginning, rather than assuming that users know how to use our API, um, and especially the nuance in our API, we should have really focused on documentation from the beginning. 
And then secondly, we should have brought in our customers earlier, right? I would say the first version of our API in many ways was unusable for the customers because of the reasons I mentioned. These are typically infrastructure folks who are less experienced with APIs. And we've had a very developer sort of focused API that wasn't really user friendly to their persona. So spending a lot more time with the customers and understanding their use cases and then developing in a more use case driven manner. Right. So those are kind of our key takeaways for our specific uh, product. Next slide. So I want to be conscious of time. So I will kind of end it there. Could have, could have probably spent another 30 minutes going into each of these slides in more detail. But uh, I apologize for all of the uh, technical difficulties and everything. So thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know what technical difficulties, you know, that, that happened. Um, well, we're a, bit, a little bit out of, out of time, but I just wanted to say, for example, that I really appreciated that on the GraphQL API, use scholars instead of strings because you can give them a semantic meaning. And so you're like, if you're passing a name, it's a name, not a regular string. That's something that I've been trying to push for. Nobody listens to me. It seems like they do to you, but that's a different story. Uh, and Absolutely. Just out of, yeah, and just out of curiosity, like you as a data platform, what is your main language in your stack? That's a curiosity I have. And I follow up in private, but just see if you can share it. Sure. I will say that our um, stack for on-prem is an amalgamation of several different languages. But I would say when we think about our SaaS platform, it's written almost entirely in Go. OK. All right. Well, I'll follow mm -hmm. up in private. Uh, yeah, I just for exchange of opinions on that. And um, all right. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, this was the last presentation of the truck so we can all jump to the main stage where we're having the final keynote thanks again rebecca and uh, i'll see you people tomorrow for the following day